I'm Sally Underwood, editor at online beauty magazine Live That Glow. This is my, my colleague, Laura Kemp. Hi, I'm the senior beauty editor. And we're joining Dr. Anthony Rossi today, who is a dermatologist based in New York, and he is going to be answering your acne questions. Hello, Dr. Rossi. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good. It's nice and sunny over there. It's just starting to get sunny here, so I'm excited. Indeed. Well, it's pretty early in the morning for you. Uh, not too bad. It's 10 a.m., which is great. And Dr. Rossi, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit. Sure. So I'm a dermatologist by profession uh, here in New York City. I specialize in skin cancer, but also cosmetic dermatology like acne or um, inflammatory skin conditions like rosacea, which we actually see a lot of depending on, you know, the, the patient population. I also work with a lot of patients who are undergoing chemotherapy for uh, cancer treatment and and still get skin conditions like acne, rosacea, um, and also want to address things like aging, like photo aging, like wrinkles, or just facial aging in general. Fantastic. And I mean, uh, we were just saying before you joined that um, a lot of the dermatologists we've spoken to have said that sort of anecdotally, they've noticed that in clinic, they're seeing a lot more acne cases at the moment. Is that something you found as well? Yeah, for sure. Acne and rosacea, sometimes they go hand in hand because they're both inflammatory skin conditions. And rosacea is also a disorder of skin sensitivity. So we're definitely seeing more people coming in what they think is like an allergic reaction or, you know, sort of sort of an inflammatory reaction. But it's actually more along the lines of rosacea or adult acne as well, which is really interesting. So I, I am seeing more of a prevalence of it. And it could be because more people are aware, right, just from social and understand, you know, the media that's out there where we're talking more and more about it and even adult acne, which is great. What, what do we think about, is behind this rise in acne? Yeah, I, I do think we're, yeah, we're bombarded by so many things now, right, in our daily lives. So not only is it the environment because, you know, from hydrocarbons in the air and pollutants to people are more physically active, so they're sweating they're working out, but also UV photosensitivity is important to think about, especially for rosacea, but as well as like what we're putting on our skin too. So people can really become sensitized or sensitive to the ingredients that they're putting on their skin. And, you know, as dermatologists, we, uh, we know that people are doing like either, you know, minimal steps or some people are going as far as doing like 12 step beauty yeah. regimens. And, you take top. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so not everything that you see online is actually that beneficial because, you know, sometimes 12 steps means like multiple ingredients that could all be sort of synergizing and actually inflaming you more. So if you're putting on multiple sure. like alpha hydroxy acids or beta hydroxy acids, more doesn't equal better. It could yeah. actually be worsening your skin. And then with all the beauty and makeup regimens that are going on, people are putting lots of sort of compounds onto their skin and it, it can cause a lot of occlusion which leads to acne or a lot of like skin irritation sure i mean and, and today we're going to go through and, and everyone who's joined us welcome thank you very much for joining us yeah. it's our first ever line um, and so we're oh, very excited i'm excited so, for that <laughs> <laughs> you you popped our live cherry yeah <laughs> the right thing today. Um, and as we're immediately removed from instagram for saying that yeah um, exactly. and, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but um, but anyone who's joined, like please, you know, if you do want to add a question in for Dr. Rossi to answer live, please do. We've collected some of our reader questions beforehand so that we've got some already to go. But we've kind of, it, you know, because it's such a big thing that everyone's dealing with, and I think there's a lot of misinformation online now. It's kind of terrifying, and it's difficult to tell what's good information, what's not. And I think, you know, if in doubt, go to a doctor. Um, and which is what we've done. Um, so um, I'm just going to ask you the sort of first questions we've had, if that's okay. Yeah, for so, sure. We've, we've said, I mean, what is the main cause of acne generally? What, what actually causes someone to get start getting acne? Yes. Yeah, so acne, we traditionally think as a dermatologist, it's a disease of like the follicular unit or the pilosebaceous unit. And that equals like the hair follicle that's in there, but also the sebaceous gland that's yeah. attached to the hair follicle. So the sebaceous gland, what it does is it, it secretes sebum or like an oil onto the skin to help lubricate it, to help it keep it moisturized. But if those sebaceous glands get clogged or occluded, they can lead to these acne papules and pustules. But it's sort of multifactorial. Well, it is multifactorial. So 
the reason why we get acne when we sort of reach that pubertal stage is because our hormones are really active. Now, those those hormones that become more increased during puberty, they actually lead to sebaceous gland activity. So we secrete more oil and that can lead to that sort of like sort of flourishing of the acne at that time. But then, you know, we also notice that people get acne into their adulthood and, you know, it doesn't always go away as a, you know, from childhood to adulthood, or maybe you never had acne as a child, but now all of a sudden as an adult, you are getting acne. And that could be also due to hormonal uh, influences or sort of dietary influences. We sometimes have to tease out like what foods we're eating or even just the emotional, I mean, emotional and environmental stressors that are happening in our life. Yeah. I mean, the hormones have got a, we've got a lot to thank you for, haven't we? I think yeah. generally in life. But, um, but I think um, you, you obviously touched on earlier the, the idea that also what we, we're doing to our skin can sometimes cause it. So how, how is it that, um, you know, what we're using can sometimes, so if it's not sort of hormonal based initially, how are we sort of causing it in ourselves sometimes with the skincare that we're using? Yeah, for sure. So in adults, especially in adults, females, hormonal acne will show up a lot around the chin area, mandible area, because it's a very common area that women break out in if they're experiencing hormonal acne that's fluctuating with their menstrual cycles. Um, if it's more acne due to occlusion, like actually blocking this, the unit, the pyelosebaceous unit, and this could be from like heavy foundations or, you know, impurities uh, on the skin, like bacteria or sweat or even just not washing the makeup off at night regularly um that that can show up anywhere and really it's sort of the blocking and not allowing the sebum and sweat to like be expelled from the skin and that and the buildup of bacteria and uh, dirt that's in there to actually just accumulate and form these acne bumps okay and <clears throat> One of the questions that a lot of people asked was what age do you generally find that it's worst? Yeah, it's a, so there are genetic influences too, right? So if your family members had acne really badly as a child, that could mean that you might get that as in that teenage uh, pub uh, pubertal stage. And we can sometimes see a lot of inflammatory acne or comedonal acne or even the the worst case of acne, which is like nodular cystic, where you really form like these large nodules painful. that are painful. Yeah. 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 And they can also lead to permanent scarring. And that's one of the reasons why we treat acne so seriously, especially in the younger adults, because we don't want that to lead to scarring, you know, later on. And if we can sort of mitigate it and bring it down and prevent those nodules from bursting or, you know, forming those craters, we can really prevent the acne scarring. But luckily now, because, yeah. So no, I was going to say that because by the time you've got to scarring, it's just so much harder. Prevention is easier than the cure, isn't it, with acne? A thousand percent. Yeah. And fortunately, now we have like really good lasers that can help with acne scarring, as well as chemical peels and some other mechanical ways that we can deal with acne scarring. But the best the best treatment is the prevention of it. And so that's why we want to take care of it uh, early in, in on in the process. And what are the best things we could be doing for prevention then? So you have to, like, I always say, like, try to identify your triggers, right? So if, if you're a teenager and you're going through puberty, that's important because then obviously, you know, it's probably the hormonal aspect that's causing that. But we can really help that along as a dermatologist if the topicals aren't taking care of it, like the topical acne medications, such as like a tretinoin, which is a vitamin A derivative, which we all know and love as an adult because it's- uh, You love. <laughs> yeah. It helps to turn over the skin cells. So not only does it help with acne because you're turning over the skin cells and you're shedding that skin faster, but you know, as an adult, it helps to improve the, the appearance of wrinkles as well. Um, but that is very useful. Topical antibiotics can also be helpful because it can decrease the bacterial load that's on the skin. But now we also have azelaic acid, which is a prescription in the States that actually helps um, with the pylosebaceous unit. And now we even have topical hormone inhibitors. Oh, wow. Right? So, yeah. So for um, especially in our female population, if they are having a hormonal surge that's causing this hormonal type of acne, we have topical medications that can actually block that 
sort of androgen production oh. locally, which is really cool. So that's like that's the newest. Game changer, isn't it? Yeah, it can be so distressing. It, yeah, it really can. Yeah, we do have oral medications that can help sort of regulate hormonal acne as well, including, you know, oral contraception, yeah. but also even uh, like other older medications that have an anti-androgen effect, such as spironolactone, which is one of them. Oh, brilliant. And I mean, obviously, for I mean, in the UK, it's a little bit different to the US, but yeah. in the UK, sort of, you know, people don't regularly have a dermatologist in the UK, whereas in the US, you know, with kind of healthcare, you know, or health insurance, you often do. But in the UK, I guess, you know, I, the first port of call would generally be to go and see your GP yeah. to see if they could then either prescribe themselves or to refer you on to a dermatologist who can prescribe. But I feel like in the UK, it's much harder to get a prescription. I think in the US, you, you guys are a little bit luckier, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, you know, I do, do say like, definitely because we have so much information out there and even like we're doing this so this is providing information to people but if the things that you're doing aren't working and you're still experiencing breakouts you know that's the time to get a dermatologist yeah. intervention because you don't want to prolong this right because we do have you know steps that we can take with prescriptions of course there's oral isotretinoin which has been around for quite some time and you know for nodular cystic acne and acne that's causing bad scarring that really is a game changer because if you can finish a course of isotretinoin there's a percentage of people that may not break out anymore after that which is which is really important you know and you in, and otherwise would you just keep it would just get worse yeah it could i mean there's sometimes acne will subside like after you go through mm -hmm. the pubertal stage but sometimes it doesn't and we we can't just rely that it's just going to get better on itself right yeah. of course things like dietary um changes may help you know eating very uh, diet rich in fruits and vegetables and less refined carbohydrates and low glycemic foods that that may help right but it doesn't help everyone so we can't just yeah. say blanket like oh change your diet it's going to get better in reality, that will help some, but not everyone. So we really want a tailored approach to acne, and not all acne is the same. Yeah, it's very personal, isn't it? And I think, yeah. uh, and the effects are obviously very personal. But right. I think, you know, one of the things that I, I think a lot of people wonder is, if you've sort of started to get acne, say, in your early 20s, say you never had it as a teen, for example, I think people wonder, like, how long will it generally take? You know, will, will it ever go away on its own, you know, with age, or that, you know, it will sort of, heal itself yeah i you know everyone says that <clears throat> how long will it take acne we see it almost as like a cyclical event so in reality some acne breakouts or flares will get better in like six to eight weeks but then it could just reflare again so you can't just rely on that it's going to get better on its own but it will have like this cyclical sort of uh, pattern that it plays out in and you know, that could be because of the skin turnover rate as well. So when we're younger, our skin turns over faster. Like the actual weeks that it takes for the epidermis to like complete its turnover event or like shed the top layer and then redevelop, that ha happens in a few weeks. But as we get older, that actually stretches out. And that's why our skin doesn't sort of bounce back as quickly as we get older. Yes, the young have all the luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But, but we, can, um, we can help that along with like other tools like lasers, microneedling, chemical peels. You know, we have all these like tricks that we can sort of pull out. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Tricks that the young don't have. Um, yeah. uh, one weapon. Yes. Um, but um, and um, we've, we've touched on this again briefly, but what sort of ingredients would you generally recommend for someone that was trying to uh, treat their own acne at home? Yeah, so there are some good topicals that are over the counter, right? But you have to sort of know how to use them because if you don't use them well, they can actually, what we said, cause more inflammation, cause more dryness, and sort of irritate you even more. Yeah. So things like a vitamin A derivative, like a retinoid or retinol can be helpful, but they can also be very irritating for certain people. So you have to know A, how to use it, and B, when to use it. So if you're experiencing like closed comedones or like blackheads or whiteheads or, you know, inflammatory pimples, it's a, it's a nice time to incorporate a retinoid or a retinol, which is over the counter, but you have to use them slowly. And then what we say, titrate up. And it's really a common misconception that more is better. But in this case, like just like a pea size amount on your fingertips yeah. 
is really all you need to get it going. And I say just put it in five points, like across the face. And then the trick is to mix it with a moisturizer because that moisturizer will help decrease the barrier irritation, but it won't decrease the efficacy of the retinoid. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, and how would you combine that with other ingredients? Because obviously a lot of people, I mean, pretty much everything seems to have salicylic acid in it now, yeah. but it's obviously <laughs> hugely popular for, for unclogging. I mean, how would you layer your retinol then with other things like salicylic acid? Yeah, so we always say start the retinol or the retinoid off only a few times a week, maybe like two to even three times a week, just to get used to it. And then a lot of people with acne shy away from moisturizers because they think it's greasy or clogging their skin, but that's actually not the case because it's helping the barrier as long as the moisturizer is non-comedogenic, which you know many are now. So you still want to use a moisturizer. And then in the day, think you know, alpha hydroxy and beta hydroxy acids are nice, but you can't sort of like bombard the skin with all of them at once. And sal acid is a wonderful beta hydroxy acid and it's lipophilic, meaning it's going to penetrate the sort of the fat soluble areas like, like the sebaceous gland. And that's why it works well on acne, but you got to go slow with it. And, you know, slower is better. You don't want to over sort of peel the face with sal acids or glycolic acids because that's also going to lead to barrier disruption and when that barrier gets irritated like our top layer of our skin our epidermis that can lead to more uh inflammatory reactions yeah so awful as well doesn't it when yeah. when you've disrupted your barrier it's just yeah it feels, think- it feels stingy it, it hurts and a good alternative to salicylic acid can be lactic acid because it's not as sort of um, astringent and it's also a bit more hydrating, but yeah. it can actually also do the job of unclogging the pilosebaceous unit and helping to exfoliate a little bit. I was going to say, are there any sort of, cause I feel like everyone's always looking for the next thing. Like, you know, yeah. this is the, the age we're in, isn't it? Where we're kind of in like, you know, like a constant trend cycle. Um, and obviously skin, you know, hasn't evolved to catch up with that. It just wants the things that it kind of wants. But I was going to say, like, are there any kind of, you know, ingredients that people don't commonly know about that you would recommend? Because we, we all know now about salicylic acid, about, you know, AHAs, you know, and to some extent now more about azelaic acid. But is there anything else that you, you feel like people don't know that's kind of underserved? Yeah, so I think there's both ways. There's things that are underserved and there's things that are overhyped, right? (laughs) So it goes both ways. But, you know, lactic acid is, it's getting, it's gaining more popularity. And I think it's a gentler uh, hydroxy acid, which is really helpful, especially for people who have more sensitive skin, but still want the effects of the exfoliant. So lactic acid is a nice one to actually look out for. Um, On top of that, niacinamide, you know, we're getting, it's getting, a lot of good press, which is, it's important. It's a form of a B vitamin and we can take it orally, but we also, it's now become available a lot topically. Again, you don't want to overdo it, but niacinamide has a good anti-inflammatory effect. It also has a, a, an anti-melanogenesis effect. So if you are experiencing hyperpigmentation, it's a good one to combine with things like lactic acid or the sal acid, because They'll both help for the hyperpigmentation, but the niacinamide is not exfoliating like an acid is. So it's a good one to synergize with. I think on the opposite end, you know, people are often combining these alpha hydroxy acid and beta hydroxy acids with vitamin C serums. And yeah. vitamin, vitamin C is a potent antioxidant, but it, it's also a weak acid and that can actually irritate you even more. So if you're combining a retinoid plus, uh, you know, a lactic acid or a salicylic acid plus a vitamin C serum, you may just be like sort of over exfoliating and over um, sort of irritating the skin. And that's when I think people do too much. Yeah, I think we well, how many videos have we all seen on TikTok of people who like their skin barriers just really, really distressed. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's becoming like a really common thing now. But yeah. um I was going to say, um, so, and, but any other ingredients at all that you think that maybe like up and coming that you haven't heard people talk about that much, but that you think are kind of, you know, gold standard. Yeah. So <clears throat> mandelic acid is another nice, interesting new acid that's, it's been around again for a while, but now we're seeing it more formulations include that, 
which is fun and exciting. And again, we're trying to get away from the over exfoliation that's happening with the traditional like glycolic acid, for example. So these newer acids are a bit more hydrating, uh, combining lactic acid with, you know, sort of encapsulated ceramides or moisturizers is now really helpful as well. So the formulations are becoming more uh, sophisticated, right? We're combining more things like ceramides, which are helpful for the skin barrier. That's really helping to decrease how much uh, irritation we're, we're experiencing. Ceramides are a natural component of our, of our skin barrier. And so now we can put them on topically as well. Yeah, and I love a mandelic acid as well. As you said, it's yeah. just so gentle, isn't it? But exactly. you still get the results. Yeah, and I, that's what we should stress for people, especially who are watching this or will watch this. You know, you don't have to destroy your epidermis to, you know, get improvement, right? You you need that patience, right? Because most of the time it's going to take at least six weeks to see some sort of improvement because that six weeks is corresponding to the layers of the skin, you know, turning over and exfoliating themselves. Yeah, uh, quite. And I, I think we, we're we also used to getting like really quick results on in everything in life right now, you know, yeah. and, um, and yeah, and our skin just, I mean, our bodies don't generally work that way, do they? But it's, and it's really frustrating. And as you said, you can obviously can't cause, you know, quite a lot more harm than good trying to go in too hard. But, um, but I mean, I think encouraging that, you know, that people should generally see, I mean, even the worst case, you know, the worst case of acne you've seen, sort of how quickly do they generally tend to respond to treatment? Yeah, it can take a while. So patience is is a virtue here. And skincare should be thought of as like a long term, you know, investment and a long term gain. And that's why I tell people not to rapidly change their skincare too much or too frequently and not to overcomplicate things because because it is a process and it's going to take weeks, you know, to even months. We're talking about, you know, a time period that you really have to wait to see the changes and it's not going to happen overnight. But, you know, in about six weeks to three months, you're going to start to notice improvements if you can really consistently keep up with the regimen. And even for like yeah, nodules, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's, it's sometimes challenging to even do that. But even with isotretinoin, you know, the course of treatments is, is months, like an oral isotretinoin. And that's something that, again, takes a lot of patience. But you need to have some sort of faith and some degree that you're doing the right thing, especially if you have a good program set forth. It's a kind of trust the process thing, isn't it? Oh, but, um, a thousand percent. Yeah. What, um, or trust the dermatologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, but I was going to say, I mean, another question we get a lot is, is there anything you can do for acne overnight? You know, as in if you've got a really bad pimple, what are the, the, the kind of quickest solutions? Sort of like pimple patches, you know, maybe sometimes a steroid injection if it's particularly bad and you've got an event or something. Yeah. For sure. So obviously having a dermatologist on speed dial is always helpful because, you know, it's a I steroid injection. <laughs> yeah. No, phone a friend. It's a quick fix to steroid injection. So if you do have an event or a big, you know, a big party, you know, getting a, a quick steroid injection will bring that inflammation down. We don't always rely on it because we don't want to be overly injecting steroids because that can also cause atrophy of the skin or a little divot. Um, Something, if you don't have access to that at home, a quick fix, if you have a really sort of like big pimple that's irritating or a little bit painful, you could put a little dollop of hydrocortisone over the counter. It's sort of like a quick remedy. You don't want to overdo it because steroids on the skin for too long can also cause atrophy or thinning of the skin. But in a quick in a quick pinch, it's really helpful. Other things like sulfur drying lotions, because sulfur has an an, a natural antimicrobial effect. Uh, You can get like a little bit of a sulfur drying lotion. That's that's really helpful. But again, you don't want to overdo it because it can be quite irritating. And sulfur is one of those sort of ancient ingredients that's been used, you know, really since back in the day like maybe even ancient egypt right they were using sulfur those as like, with their great, great skin. Yeah. <laughs> they had all the answers those ancients well that's where lactic acid comes from because it's thought that like cleopatra bathed in sort of yeah. rotten milk and that spoiled you know milk would actually produce lactic acid and that has you know that's where the idea of lactic acid probably originated from she wasn't she wasn't off base <laughs> no, no, exactly <laughs> but um going back to the steroid injections because i think it's something in the uk again because people don't tend to have a lot of access to dermatologists um that people don't necessarily know a lot about so 
so say you had um, a load of uh, pimples that had come out like a sort of cysts that were mm -hmm. really difficult and say you were getting married or you, you had some sort of huge event then how many injections could you have is it just the one pimple that you could inject no you can inject multiple and sometimes we do have to inject multiple ones because they're so inflamed we want to decrease that inflammation as much as possible because that inflammatory response also could potentially lead to the acne scarring later on because it sort of destroys the collagen that's around that area and that's what leads to that sort of acne scar divot or ice pick scar so the steroid injection actually helps to acutely bring down that inflammation that's causing the, the irritation and the pimple. And we can inject, we're injecting very, very minute, uh, low concentrations of a steroid, really dilute. So you don't need a lot and we can do many at a time. It's not our way to control the acne overall. It's just a way to acutely help it while yeah. the other medications are taking effect. I imagine it's the sort of thing though that because the results are really fast that um that people can get quite addicted to like how often could you actually have it done yeah. as you said it's not a treatment it's a short-term fix yeah we don't recommend doing it like every day by any stretch of the imagination and really maybe like once a month coming into you know because again if you use too many steroids or too much or too high of a concentration that'll de um, sort of thin out the epidermis and it can thin out the skin um, so we wouldn't want that. And you can also get, you know, we're using very, very low concentrations, but if you inject a lot, you can get also absorption into the bloodstream. Oh, wow. Yeah, no one wants yeah. that. We're, we're, no, not, we're no. not the Olympic. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> different, different steroid. And how quickly do you see results with them? I mean, is it sort of instant? It's you know, very, you, it's very quick. Like, yeah, within like 24 hours, you're going to see a decrease of that of that pimple or that irritated. So that's why it's such a nice, quick fix. And some people really love it. But again, we we tend to use it um, very sparingly. And, and pimple patches, I mean, they obviously, be, you know, you use them sometimes. They can be sort of fairly effective. And obviously, there's no sort of particular danger with using them, you know, regularly. How effective do you think they, they are for people? Like, what results can people expect if they've never used one before? So I think, I think it's pimple patches are really interesting, because a you can probably make them at home too. So <laughs> this is a time when you can you can actually do something at home, because it's usually just like a hydrocolloid dressing and, and people sell hydrocolloid band-aids over the counter, you know, like for cuts or wounds. So you could actually just cut it to the size and put it over the little pimple yourself. So you don't necessarily have to buy things that are just branded for pimples. Um, so that's like a quick just things in the shape of a star. You yeah. mean yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> like all on. <laughs> you can you can make it any shape you want, um, <laughs> but they they serve two purposes. They prevent you from picking at the acne, which for some people is actually a big deal. Like they just pick at their acne and they cause more yeah, scars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So if you're a picker, then you really should invest in these because they do prevent you from doing it. So it acts as just a physical barrier from yourself, which is. That's awesome. The other thing is that they're they're making the environment a probably you know protected from you know pollutants and dirt and more things that can irritate you. The hydrocolloid itself is is helping the epidermis by giving it a better barrier function and keeping it hydrated, which is also helpful, and just letting you help clear the acne on your own. Some of them are impregnated with things like salicylic acid or some sort of drying agent to actually just help dry out the inflammation that's there. Yeah, what do you feel about micro dart patches? Yeah. yeah. So the micro needling, you know, it's it's super interesting because we know what micro micro needling does disrupt your barrier, right? So because you're you're putting little needles into the skin, and therefore you a you want to make sure the skin is very clean, right, before you do any sort of micro needling or even using a micro needling patch, because even though those those patches have very thin, fine, fine needles, you're still poking through the epidermis. So before using any of those, make sure that the skin is cleansed, right? And you're working with a good base. So what those needles do is because they're disrupting the epidermal barrier, they're also increasing blood flow to the area. Yeah. They're causing like some sort of an inflammatory recruitment or inflammatory response. And in essence, you're trying to sort of help the, the area, the milieu of that acne sort of clear itself by increasing blood flow and increasing inflammatory response. I mean, do you 
you think it's worth because you said you can obviously make your own hydropolo patches you know at home um, yeah. do you think it's worth paying the extra for the, the micro dart patches that are sort of impregnating with some sort of active yeah if you do if you do do that use it slowly don't use it every day right because you don't want to disrupt the barrier so much that you're in constant repair mode. And if yeah. your body is always in constant repair mode, then you're always constantly trying to, you know, fix. And what you really want to do is like fix and heal and, and sort of keep it at bay. So microneedling patches are probably good. Maybe like once a week, once every two weeks, depending on how thick these, awesome. these patches are. Yeah. Cause okay. I, I imagine they're very addictive. Yeah. Um, like because you, you can you feel the response. response. You're just going to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what what is also helpful is that you're going to cleanse your skin, right, with your, your cleanser. And I don't really, as, even if you have oily skin, just having a good cleanser and doing one thorough cleanse is, is good enough. You don't necessarily want to double cleanse all the time because, again, that's stripping your natural oils and sebum. Yeah. And you need you need those, right? So cleanse the skin. You can use the microneedling patch. When you take it off, you can put on your topicals that have the active ingredients or any active peptides, because that may actually help penetrate. The microneedling may help it penetrate a little bit more. And then just, you know, use good barrier protection. So during the day, always put on an SPF. I, I prefer like the physical sunblocks like zinc or titanium mm -hmm. dioxide. Mineral something <laughs> down. Yeah. yeah, the mineral ones are so much less irritating than the chemical sunscreens. Obviously, if you only have the chemical sunscreens, those are okay as long as they're not irritating for you because sun protection is better than not having any sun protection. And yeah. then at night, always use like a good moisturizing um, uh, cream or moisturizing mask. And, and before, I mean, we, before we get to our final question, I just want to see if anyone in the, anyone who's listening at, the moment hello everyone again um uh if anyone has any questions you please do put them in the comments because honestly dr rossi is, is a font of information and if you have any because acne as you said it, it's so personal and we all have you know our own really specific questions um yeah. and so if anyone does please do ask because you know it, i'm sure you'll be very happy to answer them but the the final question we had from our readers um, which is a bit of a random one actually is is cold water better for acne that's that's a good question you know Cold, it's it's interesting. I don't think one is necessarily going to always help, but heat brings an you know blood flow to the area. So that's why um, there are many devices out there. Like red, we need, we haven't even touched all the devices that are out there, but like red light and devices that heat up the skin. What you're doing is you're bringing in blood flow and an inflammatory response to the skin, and red light is also a bit of anti-inflammatory and soothing. So that's why they're, we use them in the clinic, but there's now these at-home devices as well that use like a sort of low level of red light to help along. I Warm water is going to help you sort of open up the skin. Our pores don't really open and close, to be truthful. Like that, that's, really a, that's really sort of like a, a misgiving that people have that our, our pores like open and shrink. They really don't, <laughs> but the pores are all there. It's just sometimes they're more apparent because they're clogged with sebum and dirt and they're really, so you want to get rid of that and sort of then prevent those pores from re-clogging. So warm water is going to loosen all the dirt and sebum that's on the skin because uh, the, the hot water is helping to dissolve all that. So I like to start off with that. And then once you're finished with the, the regimen, you can use cold water as sort of a vasoconstrictor. So it actually helps, you know, constrict the blood vessels and decrease the, the redness and the, the, someone just said they hate pores. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing that works is you get older. I don't yeah. know why. They just become more apparent. So that's, that's the thing. But, you know, oh. kids have them too. It's, it's just we want to make them sort of less apparent and that's how you do it so you sort of that's why like when you go for a facial they steam your your face first because mm -hmm. the steam it's not it's not opening the pore it's just loosening all the dirt and sebum so you can effectively cleanse it out and then the cold at the end is a vasoconstrictor so it's going to tighten the blood vessels give you less redness less erythema less uh inflammation so 
that I guess you were giving me a trick question because <laughs> I like both. <laughs> I know it's early in the morning here, but so it really is. I use hot water first, followed by cold water. It's really helpful. Interesting, because I, 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 when we got that question, I was like, oh, I, I didn't even know that people did that. But I guess, I mean, I'm assuming sometimes when your acne is really sore, maybe it's soothing as well. Maybe that's why people are doing it. Definitely, yeah, and and it it, it is. But if you're if you're on a constant regimen, uh, you really should use bulk because the the heat is going to really help you loosen all that up, and then and then the cold is going to really help. Uh, sort of constrict and I'm assuming and, I mean, not hot hot no, but the kind of oh, no. warm, yeah just warm uh it's it, not only is it soothing but it, it is helpful to the skin but I do I always make the point with all my patients is that you have to have good contact time so when you're yeah. using a cleanser if you just put it on and then wash it off with either hot or cold water you're not getting the benefit really of the cleanser you're just doing sort of a a manual exfoliation with the, the act of washing. You really should put your cleanser on, especially if you have a cleanser with active ingredients in it, like niacinamide or any sort of um, hydroxy acid that's in there. You have to put it on and leave it for like about two minutes, even five minutes. So brush your teeth or do something else because that contact time is going to allow the not only the sort of surfactant to work and to loosen up everything but it's also going to give the time the time for the active ingredients to do something interesting because yeah i don't think a lot of people do that no i no. I'm, I, I probably do like two minutes i'd say i do two or three minutes now yeah but i've learned that from i've learned that from you dr oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah no two two minutes is pretty good you know but if you're wash if you're brushing your i'm not a dentist but if you brush your teeth effectively <laughs> A good two-minute brushing is is good. You know, get some floss in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Floss. <laughs> I know. The, <laughs> the bane of our existence. No, like I get like a reoccurring like white head or black head on my chin, and I can get in it the same out. Same spot. Yeah, and it'll be gone for a yeah. while, and then it will come back again. Like, why that same spot? Like, why the same? Oh. It's it's a good question. I mean, it's taunting you. <laughs> no, but <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm back. Sometimes, especially for, yeah, exactly. especially even for guys who are growing beards, you know, sometimes we get like a little clogged hair that sort of just is always sort of like in the growth phase and then oh. recircling in. And if you have, you know, sometimes I grow out a beard and men and, and anybody can really grow, <laughs> you know, no, but if you have a hair that's coming out and like reclogging, don't always keep plucking it out because that, if it's, especially if it's curly, it's just going to recurl in and you're going to get sort of like an ingrown pustule. Wow. So just like, it's best to just like snip it at the base. And even for people who have beards, I tend to tell them to shave in just the direction of the hair growth and not both ways because that double uh, blade or double cut is going to make a p really pointy hair follicle that can eventually circle back and get clogged into the skin. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Because I feel like we've all have that. There's like a spot yeah. where you, a place where you always yeah. get the same spot and you're like, just die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's telling you something. So treat it, you know, we have to be gentle with our skin. You know, it, it's meant to be protective. So like the best part of the skin is it actually is protecting things from coming inside of our body and that's what it does the best but we really can't try to destroy it um and we just have to be really gentle so try not to pick no plucking just you know be really be really gentle um, we've just uh, life by faisal has just said hi everyone hi uh, um, and if you have a question please just pop it in the comments and uh, dr rossi would love to answer but lovely to meet you um and well i mean you just touched i i know i, know I said last question but, but bonus final question <laughs> yeah, but um you mentioned um you mentioned um sort of at home like light therapies and um you know tech that you can use what what are the tech things yeah. that you would most recommend people get at home so there's a lot a lot of hype, right, on the internet. There's so we are bombarded by like products that we can have. So there's some things that actually have real good scientific backing for. And you know, I am a big fan of red light therapy. I use it in my clinic. I actually use it with photosensitizers. So that's another thing that dermatologists can do is use something called a photosensitizer that actually makes you the red light 
um, and the, the medication reacts. So it actually kills. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it, it can actually shrink the pilosebaceous unit, but we even use it for things like precancers and skin cancers too, in, in a different way. So can those be that combination. Used at home at all? Well, the red light can be used at home and that's, and the, that's the what. photosensitizers, sorry. We don't have those available, um, you know, over the counter and rightfully so because they can have like real reactions and you really want it to do that. Scary. Okay. Yeah. You, you want to do that with a dermatologist. And that's, that's something that's an in-office treatment that can work actually really well, especially if you can't tolerate like the oral medications for acne. And so, but the red light itself is anti-inflammatory and it can really help bring down the acne as well. So these red light panels that are sold, they're not all created equally because the fluence or the energy that's emitted from these lights vary by product to product. Um, yeah. But if you can get one that has, you know, a pretty good fluence, like, you know, the fluence that we use in the, the office is about 37 joules per centimeter squared. Now we're getting into like physics, but, you know, they, they do create um, these red light panels that have a decent uh, fluence on them and using them regularly, daily even can really daily. help imp yeah, improve your, your skin, but, and, you know, definitely blue protect light? your eyes. Yes. Blue light is, yes. um, so blue light, it has, you know, it can get a bad rap as well, right? Because there's all these like blue light blocking glasses and a lot of our devices emit sort of this blue light. And the caveat I say for blue light is that, you know, if you have a pigmentary disorder like melasma or hyperpigmentation, like, uh, yeah, melasma. you do have to be careful because there's a, there is some triggering of melasma with visible light and blue light and red light are both in the visible light spectrum. So different from UV, which is, you know, a different wavelength, UVB and UVA and even UVC, those are different. Those are lower wavelengths. Visible light is on the longer wavelength and that's why we can see all the colors. And then when we separate out the colors, either blue or red, we're just isolating specific wavelengths in that visible light spectrum. And blue light is antibacterial, which is, which is cool. And, you know, when used in the office or used at home, it does have an antibacterial effect. And that's why it does have some good effect on acne because acne usually has this key acne that populates into our skin. Um, so that is one of the benefits of blue light. However, if your melasma is triggered by visible light or you, you think it's exacerbated by visible light, then you, you should be careful about that. Wow. Yeah. And, and actually, aesthetic interventions has just asked about your thoughts on microcurrent devices. Yeah. I have some thoughts. Yeah, I've been wondering about these. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have quite that experience, I would love, actually. Yeah, I would, love, I would love to hear your thoughts, too, because microcurrent is similar in that you're putting, like, an electrical stimulus in there. So what you're doing is in recruiting an inflammatory response. You're, like, sort of trying to trigger your immune system locally to sort of come in and invade and help clear all that um that inflammation and bacteria away but what what happened with yours oh well i have um i've, I've always had like funny ears i have i've had tinnitus since i was about 25 and i started using a mic which may seem unrelated initially <laughs> uh, but um the um i bought a microcurrent device about six years ago and i mean great results with it um fantastic my skin's never looked better um and i looked about 12 as well <laughs> but um, but what I found is, as you said, because it triggers an inflammatory response, um, what I found was that over time using it, and I was using it on the higher setting, I will say, um, I'd obviously created a sort of inflammation that eventually kind of, I think, triggered something in my ears. And I got terrible vertigo for about three wow. weeks. And when I went to my doctor, um, he said that he thought I'd just, I'd sort of basically inflamed the muscles that had then sort of like put my balance slightly off. And I've just never used it since because of that. It just wasn't worth it for me. But I've never heard of anyone else having that reaction. Wow, that's so interesting. See, we're learning a lot from each other. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we have to talk about these things because, you know, with more, they're getting more and more popularity. So it's important to, you know, understand what you're using. And, you know, a lot of times patients come see me and they, they even forget what they're using at home. And it's not until you really probe um, that they tell you that all this thing they're using, like an AHA, a BHA, a retinoid, a vitamin C, all at once. And you're like, of course, you're coming in inflamed and yeah. or like even they forget about the devices, like the microcurrents. Exactly. 
quickly and uh, all together as you said your skin's kind of like what are you doing to me yeah (laughs) Yeah. Um, but um (laughs) life by faisal's also asked um any tips for post acne hyperpigmentation which is obviously a huge thing yeah huge and you know we all experience some degree of hyperpigmentation and it's not just if you have like higher concentrations of melanin in your skin so Highly melanized skin will be more prone to hyperpigmentation. We sort of know that because there's sort of more melanin there to to deposit and uh, create that hyperpigmentation. But even in fairer individuals, they get a lot of post-acne erythema or redness, and that's sort of like their equivalent of hyperpigmentation. So I, I don't think they equate the two. Even if you're fair, that degree of redness that sort of lingers around and hangs around, that's sort of equivalent to the hyperpigmentation that more melanized skin get. So we can treat them both. And one of the best ways to do that is to always use a constant sunblock, right? Because the sun is only going to make these worse in that the UV is just going to make you pigment even more because it's going to UVA especially gives you immediate pigment darkening and UVB can also give you this prolonged uh, sort of pigmentary response. So just by blocking UVA and UVB on a daily is going to help with the hyperpigmentation. And then we really have to sort of like improve that pigmentary deposit. So, but slowly, we have to go slowly and using all the tools that we already talked about, which is sort of the, the, the ones that help to turn over the skin. So like, Um, The retinoid, but slowly uh, niacinamide is very nice for, it's a gentle way to improve the pigmentation. But even things like topical transexamic acid is now new. And we have that in oral form, but we also have it topically, which is helpful. Uh, Kojic acid is another. Melasma as well, isn't it? Transexamic acid. It's great great for melasma, yeah. And topical uh, kojic acid is really helpful as well, because that's another plant-derived botanical that has some um, anti-melanocytic properties. And so uh, there are stronger medications out there, like hydroquinone that you can get from a dermatologist. But, you know, especially when we're talking to the the whole world, right, on Instagram, you can... uh, The whole world. The whole world. (laughs) You have to be careful about hydroquinone if you get it from not reputable sources. And dermatologists see this often like there are so many tainted formulas of hydroquinone that can have like heavy metals in them like mercury and that could lead to even more staining of the skin yeah, that's what or you something want. called yeah yeah and Sorry. i've worked around the world and i've seen this in places where there there's not available like really good compounding areas or people can get good uh clean hydroquinone and if it's tainted with something like mercury and um, we've even seen this with tainted skincare, so heavy metals, it can actually lead to like permanent uh, staining of the skin. So, you know, you don't necessarily just want to get your skincare or your prescription medications from not reputable sources. No, I never. Yeah. Uh, yeah. thing. Just I, like yeah, I've heard horror stories of people getting things from Amazon that are yeah. just not legitimate. My first yeah. ever skin peel that I bought from eBay <laughs> when I was oh, no. eighteen or something. <laughs> little little chemical burn there. Yeah. Um, but so, oh, oh being anymore. young, yeah, 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 quite. Um, mm. um, but, um, and um, but just going back to the hyperpigmentation, if people are sort of treating it with a sunblock and then ingredients that you mentioned. How, how quickly can they expect that pigmentation to clear up? Unfortunately, it doesn't go away as fast as it appears. So it takes a while for that pigmentation not only to decrease, but you have to be really patient. And we're, we're talking about like at least six weeks to really fade, if not longer. So if you're prone to hyperpigmentation, like we said before, prevention is the best treatment, right? So A, always wearing a sunblock every day, regardless if it's sunny or cloudy because UVA will also penetrate through clouds. And so even just walking around, you're getting ambient UVA exposure. Um, So always wearing sunblock and then preventing the pigmentation from coming. So no picking, no popping, no squeezing, (laughs) all the fun stuff that you do with a 10X mirror at home, you know, you got to put it away. <laughs> the drill with a 10x mirror. You can never buy one. Just yeah, save yourself a heartache. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just just put it put it away. Yeah, silent killer. Yeah, silent <laughs> killer. It is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Well, um, Carlo, Carlo is right. Exactly. <laughs> well, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to pop them in. But um, if there's nothing else, if, if, is there anything else that you, you think people should know about Dr. Rossi or that you commonly see? No, yeah. I, I, I think what's great about this whole, you know, era now that we're in is that, like, the information is robust and, right, we're all talking about it. We're not suffering silently, you know, and acne has a real emotional effect on people, right? So really you does. have to, yeah. And like, that's why we also take it seriously. It can cause a lot of depressive symptoms. You know, your face is always exposed and we want to make sure that people are seeking help and they're not just like suffering with it, you know, in silence. And so we really want to make people aware that there are really good treatments out there and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take a pill or anything like that if you're adverse to that, but that we can really deal with this both topically with devices. You know, there are new lasers on the market that we haven't even touched. So we might have to do another yeah, whole segment gonna, about devices. Please, we could yeah. do a regular clinic. There we go. <laughs> exactly. There's a whole new sort of class of lasers that just target the sebaceous glands, which is, oh, wow. Wow. it's amazing. Oh. Yeah. So like, we're really like, we're, we're in the era now of like sort of selective um, treatment of, of the root cause of what's, what's causing acne, which is super exciting. And that's fantastic. Ah. Yeah. And then hopefully people won't have to suffer. Cause I mean, my, my dad had acne in, in his twenties in like the 1970s. And my mom said, you know, when they met, the kind of like lotions and potions that he'd got from the doctor oh. were like, and she said she yeah. just felt so sorry for him because nothing was working, but he was obviously trying it all because you just hope it will. And he was obviously embarrassed because I think very few people had acne then. He's a lawyer and he was going into court and he, you know, you're trying to hide it and things. And I think, you yeah. know, it, um, and, but people hopefully won't have to suffer quite like that for too yeah. much longer. Hopefully that the tech really will catch up. Yeah. And, it, exactly. If we can prevent acne scarring, it, it saves you so much time and energy later on. But, you know, if you do have acne scarring, it's okay, too, because we now have even better treatments that can that can really help uh, improve those. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Honestly, thank you so much. And, and guys, thank you yeah. so much for your comments and everything. People love you, Dr. Rossi. Oh, no. They do, too. <laughs> Honestly, I, thank I love you. That. No, it's, it's great. I, I love, I, you know, we could talk about this for hours, but it's it's great, you know. It's really, um, you know, I love the skin. It's our most important organ, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least, the at least the dermatologist thinks so. Don't tell the cardiologist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, no, honestly, we will have to make this a regular yeah, thing definitely. because there's, just, there, there's so much around this topic, you know, yeah. and there's always questions. So, um, so thank you so much. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sasha, everyone. You too. It looks beautiful there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's it actually is. really hot now. Yes, we're yeah. going to get out of the UV. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. Enjoy. Enjoy. Oh, Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks.